Morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk to all of you. Um, I'm, I'm Nassim Ali. I'm a, a medical oncologist, as Nick has just pointed out. Um, I work here at Liverpool, and I manage soft tissue sarcomas and GIST tumours. What I was going to try to do today is go through just a bit of a background of where we've got up to over the years with GIST and GIST management. I'm going to talk a little bit about what a GIST is, which I'm sure most of you have an idea on, but I think it's just useful to put it into context in terms of how we um, consider the management and ongoing management of these GISTs. And I wanted to um, emphasize the importance of specialist teams um, managing GIST tumors. So what is a GIST? GISTs are essentially soft tissue tumors uh, from the inside of the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, but the important factor is that they're rare. They're a very small percentage of overall gastrointestinal cancers and tumours and, and a small percentage of soft tissue tumours or sarcomas. And essentially they can be small and not that cancerous or malignant or can be quite aggressive. And they can, although they occur most commonly within the stomach, they can occur anywhere within the gastrointestinal tract from the uh, esophagus down to the large bowel, most commonly in the stomach, then in the small intestines and esophagus. And occasionally, or rarely, they can just occur in what we call around the peritoneum or the lining around the uh, abdominal wall. And the vast majority of GISTs occur what we call sporadically or non-inherited, where you're likely to get one GIST tumour that, that has been growing in size. But there are other, although rarer, inherited forms, so familial types, where they have a genetic basis. And many of you will have know about the pediatric type GIST. And there's a condition associated called neurofibromatosis, associated with neurogenic tumours. So neurofibromatosis aromatosis type 1 can be related with certain GIST types as well. And the, the initial treatment of a GIST, particularly a localised GIST, is primarily surgery, if at all possible. So if someone has a localised GIST tumour and it's operable and it's safe to do, that is the, the, the main treatment of choice. Once that's happened, the importance is the histological um, assessment of it and it should be done by a specialist in GIST histopathology uh, that recognises all the intricacies of GIST tumours and it should be discussed in a specialist MDT. In most cases this will be a sarcoma MDT to do with the uh, recent guidance and just to go through why this is important. So many pathologists will recognise a GIST um, but sometimes there are certain intricacies that you have to put into context, such as the imaging findings and what the pathology looks like and some of the staining, where specialist pathologists will be able to firstly identify that it actually is a GIST. I've had situations in the past where I've been referred patients from elsewhere uh, with a, a gastric GIST, and then we've reviewed it, and actually it wasn't a GIST, it was a, uh, a gastric carcinoma, or indeed uh, soft tissue sarcoma, leiomyosarcoma. And equally, we sometimes see situations where something's called a soft tissue sarcoma and you review it and actually it's a GIST. And why is this important? The treatment is completely different if, if you need to consider any sort of medical treatments for it and outside of surgery, it, it would be very different and it can make a huge difference to the um, long-term outcome to the patient of how you manage them. So these are different pathology subtypes. I'm not going to go into the details with them, but, but the spindle cells, interestingly, are the ones that often confuse things and people often think of soft tissue sarcomas from them. But there are a number of stains that they do as well to identify. So once we've identified it, we discuss it in our pathology meetings to assess, okay, we've got a gist, what else do we need to do? And the reason we need to decide these is to decide on the risk of the gist of becoming problematic or um, indeed relapsing in the future. And the first thing we know is the, the size matters. The larger gists are more likely to recur in the future and have a higher risk. 
and potentially could have uh, effects on survival. And, and you can see on this graph that the larger the size, the larger the size of the gist, the, the, the less good the longer term outcome is if you do nothing else. Um, in addition to that, another thing we look at is how aggressive the gist looks. So we look at it under the microscope and we look for something called the mitotic count. And this is a, an indicator of the number of aggressive or malignant cells within the gist tumour, which um, helps to identify the likelihood of it causing problems or relapsing or metastasizing in the future. And if you combine the size and the mitotic count, you can then start to draw out a low versus a high risk of a GIS. So the larger the tumor, especially greater than 10 centimeters, um, with a very high mitotic count, are likely to be more aggressive or high risk. Further on for that, another thing we've re re recognized is that not only is it the size and the mitotic count, but also the location of the gist can have uh, an, uh, an impact on how it, it people do in the future. And the gastric gists are the most common, and they tend to have the, the best outcome longer term. But as you go lower down the GI tract or other points, you find that potentially they have a higher risk of relapse. Um, and so that's an important factor as well. On the whole, generally, if you have a gastric gist that is less than two centimeters, it's likely to be considered a benign gist. So you have a very, it's very unlikely to cause you problems in the future. But once you're going on from that, I think it's important to stratify the risk so that we can decide ongoing management for these patients. And, and what we decide from this is whether we need to consider other treatments beyond surgery and um, any other treatments around surgery as well, which I will talk about. So this is reasonably old, and I've put this up intentionally because I'll talk about the ongoing management as we go along. But the, the plan for a gist tumor is ideally you resect it if you can, and once you've resected it, you identify it's a gist, then the, um, identify the, the risk status of it, and from the risk status, you will then de determine the ongoing follow-up management and um, any other treatments that might be required. Okay, so we've talked about localized treatment, and I'm going to stop there on the localized for a while and come back to that. But what do we do if it can't be operated on or it's difficult to operate without causing significant problems to other parts of the anatomy? Or what if it's already spread to other organs? So this is an example of a, a large small intestinal gist, which um, I don't know how many have seen CT scans before, but this is the abdomen in cross section, and this is the gist here, which it shouldn't be occupying that much space, and it's pushing all the organs out. Um, so this had um, different a number of lumps associated with it, so it wasn't uh, immediately operable. In order to understand our treatments a bit, I'm going to put up a technical picture, and I was trying to avoid any technical pictures, but this is a, um, what we call a, a protein receptor on GIST cells called KIT, which may, many of you will have heard of. And, and what KIT is, it's something that is stimulated by a chemical in the body to start cells dividing rapidly and growing over and beyond what they should be doing. And the vast majority of GIST tumors will overexpress KIT and because of an abnormality in the gene that controls KIT, the CKIT gene, and therefore you get overgrowth of the cells because it's telling the nucleus in the cell to keep growing and keep growing. And because of that, one of the things we think about is how can we stop this protein gr stimulating the cell to keep growing? And that's where imatinib, which or I shouldn't use the trade name really, should I? No. <laughs> that's why imatinib um, is um, now being identified as a, as a treatment for GIS. What imatinib does is it, it inhibits this uh, receptor and it's present as we've said, in vast majority of GIST tumors, and by inhibiting this receptor, it doesn't allow the cell to grow and survive in the same way. And therefore, imatinib has been an effective treatment for a number of years now for 
showing a response in GIST tumours, and, and vast majority, about 85%, will show a response because of the uh, kit receptor on Im imatinib. However, um, as I showed you on this diagram, the, there are different gene types that create this um, kit receptor overexpression. So you can see this thing on the left says exon 9, 11, uh, 13, 17. And, and you may have heard of these and looked at it the online. And what these are, exons are locations on the gene, and any abnormality in that gene location stimulates the abnormality in the receptor. And what we do know now is that certain different types of GIST will respond in a different way to the imatinib. So what here I, I've shown is the imatinib inhibits the activation of this protein receptor and therefore it can't grow and th that's how we get the uh, responses in GIST tumours. And if you look here, um, the patient we described earlier on, on the left, um, had the large tumour and within two months it's shrunken down significantly. But the other thing to note that um, with the eye of faith, the the tumour on the right-hand side, so this is before, this is after, um, looks darker as well. So not only does it shrink it down, but it also kills off the cells in the gist, and you often get what we call a necrotic change, and it looks darker as well. And I think this is important because not everybody always recognizes this, and there are occasions with managing GIST where sometimes you see the GIST tumors actually got bigger with the treatment as a result initially with the imatinib because it liquefies due to the necrosis. And that's an important factor to be aware of, and another reason it should go through a specialist team. There are radiologists who recognize this, and sometimes you'll see an ex uh, a scan report says the GIST has grown and therefore consider as progressive disease on treatment. And then you look at the scan, and it may have grown, but it's gone liquefied and bigger, and, and it hasn't actually progressed. It's actually responding, and it will probably shrink down with time. Um, so another reason why specialist teams are important. So imatinib, um, certainly know this table has been <laughs> probably taking it, and others may have had it in the past. It, it's, a, it's a tablet form of treatment. It's actually fairly reasonably well tolerated, but there are side effects, as with any medication, uh, commonly fluid retention, particularly around the eyes and sometimes around the ankle, can sometimes cause nausea. And I know a lot of patients who have sort of figured out ways of taking it during the day with certain types of food to suit them best. Um, but interestingly, um, I was discussing with someone earlier on that I, I started as a consultant here in 2007 and a few years prior to that, uh, during training, imatinib was really taking off in GIST management and we've learned so much about it. But at that time, we didn't know how well patients did on imatinib from the trials and now we know patients can be on it for years and years and do really well on it. Having said that, there are some situations of GIST where it may not respond to matinib, uh, where it's resistant to it, either at an, at an outset, as a primary resistant, because of the different gene types, or it can sometimes develop resistance with ongoing treatment. Um, so the sporadic GIST, the ones that are not inherited, um, we have these different gene types that occur, and they will d respond in different ways to imatinib. But equally, we have the syndromes, or the genetic ones, where some may respond to gen uh, imatinib or in different doses of imatinib, and some will have different, um, not have the particular kit genes or other types of genes where it won't respond to imatinib, and then we have to think about other types of treatments for them. So as a, as, a, as a whole, in terms of the mutations that we know about, and these, this is a, a bit of a generalization, but the common ones. So the most common gene type we hear of is the exon 11, which some of you may have heard of. And it commonly occurs in gastric and other types of GIST and tends to be the most responsive to imatinib. Uh, exon 9 um, is a, the second most common, and that tends to respond better to a higher dose of imatinib, so 800 milligrams instead of the 400 milligrams, which many of you may be taking. Then we have um, the, the exon 18, which we call a PDGFR D842V, which is about just under 20% of some gastric gists, and this is notorious for not responding to uh, imatinib. 
um, and, and it's worth knowing this because it could impact on how you manage the patients in the future. And then we have um, where, uh, the, what we classify as the wild type, um, which is described as where we can't identify an obvious uh, gene mutation. And these typically don't respond to imatinib, although it's nothing's 100%, and there we do have to consider other treatments for them. Everyone with me so far? <laughs> okay. So what if imatinib doesn't work or stops working? What's the next line we use? Uh, sunitinib is another uh, inhibitor of the same uh, sort of pathway, but it affects the pathway in different areas. And quite often we find that if imatinib has stopped working, sunitinib then can be uh, used, and it shows an activity as well, and it's been evidenced in trials to do so. And we, we do see patients who, who have responded to this, the, the, the durations in the trials are, are perhaps a bit shorter than the imatinib durations, but GISTs don't always follow trials and patterns, and we do have patients on sunitinib for many years as well. The difficulty with sunitinib, however, is the side effect profile is a little bit worse than imatinib, and, and there are other side effects where patients can feel more fatigue, um, Diff um, hand and foot syndrome where you get peeling and uh, pain on the hands and skin on the hands and feet and it can also have an impact on the thyroid function um, which which can sometimes have effect on your well-being as well uh, and not to mention it can discolor your hair and make it go pale and white um, beyond sunitinib now we have regorafenib, which has shown evidence um, of being beneficial in GIST tumours. Um, and this, uh, once again, like sunitinib, works on different aspects of the, um, what we call the tyrosine kinase pathway. And this also, once again, has quite significant side effects. And once again, particularly gastrointestinal side effects, such as uh, sickness, diarrhea, uh, fatigue. It can affect your liver enzymes, so you have to be cautious with that and monitor that while on treatment. Um, it can affect your blood pressure, and once again, can affect the thyroid and cause uh, hand and foot syndrome. And it's now recognized and approved as a third line treatment uh, for GIST tumors. So, what do we do beyond that? More recently, we have Repretinib which um, has shown benefit in trials in GIST after uh, three or more previous tyrosine kinase inhibitors, so uh, imatinib and, and others. Um, and and the, the guidance from the drug is to use it after th three or more TKIs, including imatinib. Now, it, it's not... Uh, is anyone here on re repretinib? I assume not. No. So it's not technically on the NHS sort of funding scheme yet, but it is recognised and licensed, and the company are offering it on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. So I have used it in a couple of patients on this way where it felt appropriate to do so, and I know colleagues around the country have been doing the same. So it, it is there to use, if that makes sense. And more recently, um, there's a drug which many may have heard, uh, avapritinib, um, or it was in the trials called the BLUE285, um, which is another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, covers the kit and something we call the PDGFR receptors. Um, and this has been shown to be effective in a number of GIST cases, but quite importantly, it's shown activity in this PDGFR D842V mutation. If you remember, I talked about that earlier, said it doesn't tend to respond to imatinib, and it doesn't tend to respond very well to sunitinib or agarafenib either. And therefore, this, this is really important in that um, potentially patients with this mutation, if they need to be on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor for progressive disease, this may be a treatment option. The downside is it's not available at the moment in the UK on the NHS. And I've, <laughs> careful how I say this, I've tried to look at ways <laughs> that we can sort of get access to it. And, and I know colleagues around the country are doing the same sort of thing. 
and and it's quite difficult sometimes because um, sometimes when these drugs are evaluated, they're evaluated in the context of GISPs as a whole. And I think it's important to know that we're not thinking about it whole. We're thinking of it for particular subtypes of GIST. And, um, and I'm not sure that's always appreciated when, when these are um, uh, looked at for, for funding, etc. Um, I hope I haven't spoken out of place in there, but I think that's, that's where we are uh, with getting these drugs at the moment. But it's important to know that there, there is this drug there. Um, so what are the therapies or upcoming therapies are there and might there be? So th those are the, the, the drugs we know of and have license for management of GIST. Um, some of you uh, may be aware um, of the CarboGIST trial that occurred under the ORTC some years ago, which showed another uh, drug of a similar family called carbozantinib, and that on the early trials, a lot of us were involved with that, um, showed some early uh, um, responses in GIST in that the outcome was that this showed no evidence of progression over a three-month period, and that looks promising to use in future trials. The other thing is uh, looking at other more exper experimental or non necessarily TKI type treatments. Um, and some GIST types may carry this, something called a mutation called BRAF mutation, which we often see in melanomas. And BRAF, um, anti BRAF treatments might be useful for that. The other thing which I think is I interesting and worth pointing out is um, there's, there's, there's a gene type called NT NTRK, which is. Um, stimulates different solid tumors, which causes them to outgrow themselves. And it's a rare gene type, but it's common in certain types of breast cancers and other solid tumors. But there's also uh, a higher incidence of them in some soft tissue sarcomas, particularly children's type soft tissue sarcomas, and also uh, potentially um, in some wild type GIST types. And therefore, it's always worth checking an NTRK status because there are treatments that are licensed for use um, in soft tissue tumors with the NTRK mutation. Um, and therefore, and, and these have shown quite good responses in the overall solid tumors. So it, I think it's something worth bearing in mind. The other thing I think it's worth talking about is often we're thinking about reintroducing imatinib after we've used other uh, treatments in between because we sometimes get changes in the resistance again and imatinib can be useful again afterwards. Um, so what if we have a, uh, a tumour, a GIST tumour, for example this one in the pelvis, um, which is going to be a difficult thing to operate on and, and it will carry too much uh, side effects from the surgery. Well, what we can do there is consider treatment before surgery. And this is what we call neoadjuvant or preoperative imatinib. And we use this for trying to minimize the surgery, having less um, morbidity from the surgery, and also in difficult locations where there are things like the bladder, such in the pelvis. Um, and, and that's a, a useful way of trying to shrink down the gist tumor, um, make it more operable, remove it and have less operative morbidity afterwards. So going back to the localized ones where we've talked about the risk factors of um, GIST tumors, um, what we need to think about then is if someone's a high risk, is there anything we can do to reduce the risk of it coming back? And the answer is yes. So many of you might be aware that we use post-operative imatinib or adjuvant post-operative imatinib to reduce the risk of high-risk gists. And this was initially shown in some uh, Scandinavian trials where one year of imatinib was compared to doing nothing. And it showed an improvement in reducing the risk of the relapse. But it wasn't really clear what impact this had on survival. And this was further taken forward <coughs> by you comparing imatinib for 12 months compared to three years. And there was certainly an improvement in reducing the, um, the, 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 the risk of relapse, but also, in addition to that, the uh, overall survival 
for these patients. So the patients that were included were those with high risk, so large tumours, high mitotic rate, and what they included was tumour rupture as well. So therefore, for any patients in, in the UK, the NHS guidance is based on this table, um, where we look at the location, the size, and the mitotic rate to define the high risk features. And I would say that you look at that, assess the risk, if it's a high risk, and I would include tumour rupture in that, because that automatically puts people in high risk, um, they should be considered for adjuvant imatinib for three years at 400 milligrams once a day. Doing the mutational analysis on these, looking at the exon mutation is important because it may be a gist which may not respond to imatinib and you wouldn't want to put them through three years of uh, imatinib in that situation. So why are specialist teams important? I hope that I've highlighted so far that recognising a gist, recognises the variance in the gist, recognise when we need to treat them, and what sort of treatments to implement, and how a treatment is responding is important to be uh, to b to to recognise so that the specialist teams here would be looking at these and used to looking at these. The other thing is um, sometimes it's not simply a matter of putting someone on a drug, treating them, see how they respond. If they've done well, fine. If they haven't done well, going to the next one. We sometimes have to think outside the box. So this patient, um, I don't know how well you can see that, um, back in about 2014, developed uh, a small intestinal gist right near the pancreas, and it was touching up to the vessels near the pancreas and the pancreas itself, and it was considered inoperable, so they couldn't operate on it without leaving, leaving things behind. So he was initiated on um, imatinib, 400 milligrams, and had a good response, and then when it plateaued off, it started to grow again slowly, and then when it had sunitinib and shrinkage and had surgery. And then after surgery, um, some months later on, developed some small liver metastases. And at that point was put back on imatinib and responded with the liver metastases for a number of years since. More recently, the patient had one new liver metastases and all the other ones were stable. So would we change the treatment? Go on to second line? We know when he had sunitinib the last time round, he, he did struggle with it. So we want to think about, is there anything we can do for just one? And sometimes what we consider for progression of localized area w in the context of everything else being stable is considering removing that localized area or indeed other local regional treatments. And in this patient, we've geared, we geared him up for microwave ablation of the liver metast metastasis whilst leaving him on the imatinib um, for the rest of the disease. So we've dealt with the, 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 the atypical bit of it. Incidentally, in the same chat, we did a scan. We noticed just at the top of his um, femur bone, there was this. And this is actually a, a bone metastasis. And many of you may know that bone metastases aren't that common in GIST tumours, but we do occasionally see them. So we scanned the rest of him and there was no other bone metastasis. And we thought this is a solitary lesion, biopsied, confirmed a GIST. Um, so what do we do? Once again, he's at it, it's, it's a localised progressive area and the rest of the disease was stable. Where this is, is at the neck of the femur, so it's at risk of fracturing through. Um, and in fact, there probably was a little crack appearing in it when we looked carefully on the imaging. So he actually had this resected and uh, a prosthesis put in that part of the hip and, and then radiotherapy following that to reduce the risk of return again. Um, and radiotherapy isn't normally considered with all types of gist, but we do sometimes consider it. And we know it can be used in some control settings and symptom settings as well. So this is the use of surgery again in a, in, a, in, a, in a GIST patient, a metastatic GIST patient, sorry. Um, I brought, put this picture up. Um, so the pediatric and wild type GIST, I know I haven't talked a lot about that, but, um, and uh, I know 
this table is probably <laughs> interested in that side. The, the they're, they're often a, a challenge to treat in terms of imatinib not necessarily always working on them. Um, and and when we treat the original tumor, we treat treat them with surgery and then monitoring. And we often consider surgery again for other recurrences. And and we're desperately looking for other treatments that might be effective. And I know the the pause gist clinic and team, so Ramesh etc., is looking for treatments such as the SDH deficiency gist and you know treatments that will be addressing those problems. But we we had a patient. Um, who was a, a young patient with a pediatric and wild type who had a treatment for it many years ago as a child and then again had a, rec uh, a, a new uh, distal gastric gist which was removed and a couple of liver lesions at the same time which were removed at the same time. And then uh, uh, about half a year later developed more liver lesions and metastases. And we took it to our liver surgeons who incidentally are also our soft tissue retroperitoneal sarcoma surgeons and said, you know, can we deal with this? And then jointly we came up with this idea. If it's in the liver only, is there anything else we can do just to target the liver? And there's a process called SIRT, or CERT, where um, the interventional radiologist target the, the artery to the liver, blocking off all the vessels going off to the small bowel, and they inject Radio uh, radiation beads, and these go to all the different parts of, of the circulation of the liver and essentially radiate high-dose radiotherapy to the individual metastases. And this was being used in some other cancer types, the like colorectal cancers, and um, um, been effective. However, it's come off the funding now for colorectals because it's not clear how effective it can be for longer term. So this patient had SIRT and 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 did really well and went on for a number of months. Now, there isn't funding for SIRT, but we, we had a way through, because our, our interventional radiologist does a lot of SIRT and has had a number of links with the compa companies that provide the material for the SIRT. So he happily does the treatment on the NHS and gets compassionate um, supply of the, the materials for the procedure. So we did it on this patient and she did really well. Years later, hasn't had any progressive disease. And um, because through the pause gist, Ramesh, Belusa and myself and other team members have been discussing these, and we've had other patients come through as well. And up to date, we've had at least three done. And this is an example of one where you can see these solid tumors in the liver and they've had the SIT and they've become black holes which there's a really good response to the treatment. And they've had these black holes remaining on ongoing scans. Now, th th this isn't a commonly done technique, but it's certainly something worth considering. The difficulty is long-term effects um, because it can affect the liver function um, and, and, and it can affect the liver enzymes. And w we, we don't for sure know how it might affect liver healing longer term. But certainly, we've got a number of years with some patients and they have done well. There are, I think there's a, a clinician or two in the States that have done a few as well. And, and there are thoughts of trying to get the data together to have an idea of you know how we can take this forward and whether we could make a case for using this in more patients with, with, with these tumors where we're not we don't really have uh, a, a good medical treatment to treat it at the moment. So something to keep an eye out for. So just in conclusion, um, so GISTs are rare soft tissue tumours, um, but they're important, and they're important because it affects people in different ways, and, and the treatment can have such a different impact, I think, in terms of the longer-term outcomes of patients. Um, I, I don't think it's... Uh, I know a lot of people felt in, in district hospitals, you see a gist, start them on a matinib, it's easy, that's fine. But I don't think it's just like that. I think the, the, the challenges are with the ongoing management of these patients. And I think that's where the specialist teams are really important. And, and there are several aspects to the management and, and considering surgery, different medical treatments, um, the imaging, 
uh, even radiotherapy. And, and, and I think there's always something to learn. So if they're all centralized in specialist teams, we're all learning from it. And as a lot of you will know, these sarcoma and GIST communities are small. We all know each other. You know, we're at the end of phones. We've got long phone books. <laughs> and we, we, we speak to each other. And, you know, we all come up with ideas, bounce off ideas. And, you know, we refer to each other for, for trials, etc. So that's the important. So... I tried to keep it short and I don't know if I've succeeded, but thank you very much and I hope that was helpful in giving a background.